In the first branch of the Mabinoki, Puich, the prince of Dubed, trades places with Araun, the king of Anuvan. Puich spends a year in this otherworldly realm, which is said to be incredibly beautiful, where noble men and women dress in golden brocaded silks, where the food is plentiful, the horses are gleaming white or dappled grey, and the courts are rich and opulent. Kreuzer, welcome to the Welsh Witch Podcast. I'm your host, Mara Starling, and today I am absolutely delighted to say that I am joined by the wonderful Dr. Gwilym Morris Baird. Gwilym graciously came on to discuss the concept of the Otherworld of Wales with us. We explore the Otherworld in mythology, folklore, and the bardic tradition in this episode. Now, Gwilym Morris Baird studied Welsh medieval literature at Bangor University. He is a musician by trade, and he also teaches on subjects relating to Celtic studies over on his website, CelticSource.online. You may have seen him around. He rather wonderfully spreads his knowledge via YouTube, Facebook, and of course, via his courses. If you haven't heard of him, I very much recommend heading over to his website and checking him out. Now, the other world within a Welsh context is incredibly interesting, yet it's also a rather untouched area. Often misunderstood and misrepresented, I was glad to be able to chat with Gwilym about this place. A chthonic realm, a place beyond the sea, islands of enchantment, the realm of fairy. Yes, the other world of Welsh lore is a diverse place, and perhaps the other world is a bit of an incorrect label to attach to such a place, and other worlds, plural, would actually fit better. But anyway, without further ado, grab a nice panad, make yourself comfortable, let us part the mists and chat all things otherworldly within a Welsh context. <laughs> So I am here with the brilliantly knowledgeable Dr. Gwilym Morris Baird, and I'm a little bit starstruck because I've been watching Gwilym Morris Baird's videos online for years now. Gwilym, welcome to the Welsh Witch Podcast. How are you tonight? Thank you very much for the invite. Very happy to be here. Oh, brilliant. I'm so thankful that you agreed to come on. And tonight we're talking about something that I think is very interesting. And I think in my opinion, you are the one person who I've watched online who has a really interesting perspective on this topic, and that is the other world in Welsh mythology, or Anuvan, and the concept of the other world in general. So just before we get into all that, and we get into the concept of Anuvan and start digging deep into that, I just wanted to ask, could you maybe introduce yourself a little? What's your connection to Welsh mythology and Celtic studies? So, hello. My name is Gwilym. Uh, I'm really an accidental academic, I suppose. Um, I'm a musician by trade, uh, and I needed what we might call today a side hustle and ended up going to university to study Welsh literature in Bangor and just ended, ended up staying there. I'd always had an interest in Celtic mythology in general. Uh, and I'd always, you know, sort of read around the subject. So I kind of knew I was going in that direction, but I didn't expect to stay for as long as I did. Uh, and then by today, um, I'm still kind of a musician. Um, I still try and do that. But I also, I work as a, an online tutor. I teach courses uh, on Celtic mythology. And I try, and I suppose what I'm really trying to do is to see what these old texts tell us about what people used to believe, but also try and fit them into what people might believe today as well, so that they're contemporary, that, that we're, we're using, you know, ancient materials, but to do something today in culture right now. So I suppose that's the 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 brief, yeah, CV. You studied, was it Welsh literature, medieval literature at Bangor University? Yeah, so I actually started doing a creative writing degree, and, you know, like yourself, 
educated through the medium of Welsh. So it was natural for me to go on to do all the rest of my education, higher education in Welsh. Uh, but then I was offered a place to do an MA and it was essentially looking at uh, prophecy poetry in the Welsh Bardic tradition. And then I ended up doing a PhD in basically in the Welsh Bardic tradition. But I always had an interest in the four branches of the Mabinagi and how the Welsh Bardic tradition fits into the broader context of Celtic myth, if you like. So yeah, that's that's my area of expertise. I, I always want to ask this to anyone who um, has grown up because I'm I'm sure you're aware, but the well, having te- taught courses online and such yourself, there's an interest in Welsh mythology and Celtic mythology in the broader sense across the world nowadays there's people from like far far off across the entire globe that have an interest in these myths that are rooted in the landscape that we come from and I always want to ask people who come from this area especially the same kind of area as me because you're also from the north Gog like me Mm -hmm. and I always tell people that the myths of Wales, like the four branches of the Mabinogi and all that, they were a huge part of my upbringing. They were a huge part of my life long before I got into my side of things, which is witchcraft and paganism. Long before that, the Mabinogi were there. I remember going to watch plays about Branwen. I went to watch a pantomime in Bangor once about Branwen and they sang a Mao Heard at the end of it and it was great. (laughs) But... A lot of people don't believe me when I say that because there are some people in Wales who did not have that privilege, who did not get taught these myths. So I'm just wondering, really, did you have any um, kind of involvement or I suppose passing interest in these myths or were you taught about them in school before you got to kind of an academic level at higher education? Did you know about the myths beforehand? Yeah, I mean, like yourself, since primary school, really, you know, I remember um, we were, when I was, I must have been really small, uh, like six or seven, hearing about Ben de Gaithran from the second branch of the Mabinogi and, and actually getting a bit scared, you know, because it was quite a good uh, storytelling of that story. And then the four branches of the Mabinogi in particular and the Taliesin myth are kind of staple a staple part of Welsh culture, and they've influenced modern literature. So we've got modern poets and modern authors and modern dramatists recreating versions of these myths in modern Welsh culture all the time. So they're kind of, they're in our culture and their potential to be myths in the full sense of the word is always there. You know, they're not always presented as myths as perhaps people in the pagan community would understand, but they're definitely available for that. They're always close at hand, if you like. So yeah, it was kind of a, a natural process really to to go on to study them because I was so captivated by them, fascinated by them. I have to admit, I have a similar story with Bendy Gaidvran because we um we used to have an art teacher that came into my primary school and um we used to do these grand art projects so we'd put them up in the uh the cake the it was the hall and the canteen in one because i went to a school that only had 26 students um but we used to put these big murals up and stuff and we did an entire project on um the story of branwen and bendy gaithran and all that when i was i think in year four or something like that and we created this huge mural on the wall of Bendy Gaithran crossing the sea to go and rescue um, Branwen. And it was terrifying and I loved it because of that. So yeah, it's it's part of our culture and it's definitely intertwined into everything that we do. And I suppose from that, I just want to ask you, do you have a myth or a legend or a folk tale or anything like that that is maybe a favourite of yours, maybe one that you go back to a lot, one that you're very nostalgic about or just have a fondness for? I love all of it. Yeah. And, and especially, you know, I'm really fortunate in that I get to work. So I get to really get to grips and live in these sources all the time. But I'll always be fond of the first part of the first branch, um, which is Puich's journey to Anovn, funnily enough, and back. Uh, because it was that story in particular when I was doing my first, uh, undergraduate degree. I went and I wanted to write my my main thesis for that degree on the the four branches of the Mabinogi. And I set out thinking, oh, I'll just, you know, do like a psychological interpretation because I was kind of into young and all that stuff at the time of the whole thing. And then I read the first, what, four or five pages of the, the four branches. And I was like, no, I've got to write my whole thesis just on this episode because it's so rich. And it was the first story that really showed me how deep the rabbit hole goes, if you like, in terms of of these stories, because they're, you know, they they 
they mean lots of things. They they can be myths in the traditional sense, but they're also allegorical and, you know, um, obviously used as teaching tales in the past. So they mean they've got all these different registers, if you like. So yeah, it was the the first branch, the first part of the first branch um, that that turned me on just to the whole concept of of symbolic narrative and depth of meaning. And that these were teaching tales that had more to say than just the simple events that appear on the surface. I think for me, mine is based entirely on nostalgia. The story of Bradwell the second branch of the Mavinogi, I remember we did so much on it in school. But yes, I think these myths and stories are really important, not only to our culture, but in a global level as well, because I was talking recently, not recently, a few months back now, the podcast has been on hiatus for a bit, but a few months back in a former episode, I was talking to um, Ellis, uh, CCJ Ellis. Um, They've just come out with a book called Welsh Monsters and Mythical Beasts. And they are really interested in the idea that, you know, Welsh myths have influenced so much of pop culture and the um, kind of fantasy genre of films and books and all sorts, the way that they've inspired things like Tolkien and Game of Thrones. And it's almost like Welsh mythology is everywhere and nobody really notices it unless they know. And we were talking about how that's kind of sad, I suppose, that we're, we've been so influential on, I say we as if I've written the stories, but we as in the Welsh have been so influential on the way storytelling has evolved into what it is today. And yet we're still quite little and unknown almost <laughs> to the rest of the world. I still remember going to university and people not knowing that the Welsh were a thing, that we were even a country. So I, I guess they people don't realize just how much influence these myths have had on us. And would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. I think we've always kind of punched above our weight culturally, but only ever to our own recognition, I suppose. Um, And, you know, this has been going on for well over a thousand years. The whole Arthurian cycle of European myth is firmly rooted in the Welsh tradition and was, you know, basically nicked from Wales by an an, an Anglo-Norman who needed some great stories to tell. And I think that the Welsh storytelling tradition has always been incredibly rich and incredibly fruitful ground for other people to borrow, if you like, which is kind of fine. That's how culture works, you know, influences come and go. But I, I do, I feel a little bit like you, Mara, sometimes, is that I do wish that, that Welsh culture, historically and in the present day, would have a little bit more recognition for for what's been gifted to the world, you know, like... Uh, um, not that I'm jealous of necessarily of of how Irish culture is interpreted in the world, but you know we see other Celtic cultures have a very different reception. Let's say I think I, I want to kind of segue, and I want to ask a question that I was going to ask you closer to the end. So obviously this is the Welsh Witch podcast, and I class myself as a Welsh folk witch and a Celtic polytheist. So these myths and stories, they are not only a huge part of my cultural background, but they're also rooted in my spiritual and almost religious beliefs nowadays. It's the way that I live my life, and these stories have a huge influence on that. And I'm just wondering, um, I suppose my question is twofold, so I'll throw two questions at you, and hopefully that's not too much. But essentially, I want to ask, first and foremost, do you have any, um, like, you know, do you have any interest in paganism or do you identify yourself as such or anything like that? And then secondly, as somebody who has studied these myths on an academic level, do you ever come across anything within, say, the pagan sphere? Because I'm assuming a lot of pagans are drawn to you and your work. Um, that's how I started. I, I got drawn to your work because of my interest in paganism and witchcraft and such. So I'm assuming you get that bunch, our bunch, the the lunatics like me, coming to you and wanting to learn more from you. So I just, it's a question that I like to ask anyone who kind of looks at Welsh and Celtic mythology outside of spirituality and within the realms of academia. Is it interpreted differently in those kind of spheres? And is there anything within kind of paganism that is almost problematic and comes across as almost like it's harming the myths in any way? Oh, God. I mean, how long have you got? Um, well, for me, me, me personally, I've got no idea what I am. But... I certainly have a spiritual life, uh, for want of a better way of of calling it something. 
Uh, I don't call myself anything more than things I need to call myself at times. People from the outside would probably say, oh, he's definitely a pagan. Other people might say, oh, no, he's definitely this. And other folks might say, oh, no, he's definitely that. So um, I don't worry too much about self-definition in those terms. I've definitely done loads of things in my time which were have been intensely powerful for me in terms of spiritual experiences. In terms of paganism as a culture and, you know, my involvement in it, um, I just find it totally fascinating, to be honest with you, that such an ancient culture can be given new life from generation to generation. And I think I'm far more open-minded than I used to be about modern cultures of spirituality. You know, I remember when I started doing my degree in Bangor, I came across a lot of uh, Druids in the English tradition. Um, and I was kind of offended, I suppose, by what they were doing, because I felt like it was a type of cultural appropriation. But then when I actually looked at the history of the evolution of modern Druidry and where it comes from, um, it kind of begins with Yola Morganog, who was like a fantastic, you know, mystic Welshman. Um, and so my attitude has changed a lot, you know, personally speaking, I'm far more open-minded than I was, and I'm far more interested in seeing how myths are alive today, not just for my own spiritual nourishment, uh, but also how it nourishes other people. Uh, and I think that, um, I would encourage more people to be more open-minded about, uh, about it on both sides of the equation within paganism and the broader spiritual culture of, you know, what we might call Anglo-America, but also in the more secular or academic uh, sort of branches of Welsh culture. I'd encourage more open-mindedness on both sides. And I kind of feel like I'm bridging the two, to be honest with you. I've often felt like that. Um, maybe I just like being in the in-between place so much that I am i don't like being one or the other. You know, I'd rather be try and be all the things. As far as there being a problem, yeah, there there is a problem, and there's there's a, I suppose the problem is misrepresentation, and it's about being able to respect sources, and to respect the historical culture, and to allow for the integrity of that culture, while also acknowledging that the current lived culture that emerges from that history is also going to evolve and change. So it's kind of, again, it's it's um, it's this liminal position of we can't misrepresent the sources because we are, we are, we're denying future generations the opportunity to understand them as unbiased as they can, yeah, without a filter. So we don't want to misrepresent the historical culture of the Celtic nations, but I think it's possible to also do that and explore modern culture and modern framings of spirituality, which is a word I actually have a lot of trouble with, but, you know, it doesn't really matter to me. We're trying to communicate, aren't we? Um, but whatever that is, you know, I think that we also need to allow for it and encourage it because I think it's good for people, yeah? I think there is a nourishment uh, in in that type of engagement with these sources. So I think what we suffer from and I say we as perhaps like a very broad subculture of people interested in Celtic myths, whoever you are or whatever you do, uh, be you a purely sceptical academic or the, the biggest rainbow hippie going, and everyone in between, uh, I think that we do suffer from misrepresentation. And that's historic because we've been through several generations of people usually from outside of Celtic cultures dipping into it and taking what they want and reformulating it in a way that justifies the things that they want to believe in and then presenting that as genuine Celtic tradition. And it still goes on to this day. Uh, now, I'm not a call-out person. I'm, I'm not that combative, um, mainly because I don't think it's that fruitful. But if there was ever an anonymous way of critiquing and criticising some of the sources that have been, you know, some of the, the the work that's been done in the last few decades, then I would, because I think we do need to sort of tighten up our understanding of the sources while allowing for interpretation of those sources. And interpretation is where 
subjectivity comes in. It's where the spiritual dimension comes in. It's where we allow for creative, profound, mystical, creative, academic engagement with the sources. Because, you know, it must be stressed that all academics are doing are interpreting but they're interpreting with a very strict sense of logic and rationality. And all modern pagans are trying to do is interpret, but using a different logic or rationality. So in my view, we're all trying to do the same thing. Um, and, and we just need to be wary of, yeah, respecting the sources, basically. It's okay to be inspired and to have, what is it, UPG, personal gnosis, you know, that's that's absolutely what we need to be doing but we can do both things we can do that and allow for that being our interpretation and just to finish because i know i'm ranting now a bit but where you know i think it's a problem of authority and self-authorship that people don't feel confident enough to say well this is my vision and my interpretation and my experience of this source and instead there's a tendency to dress it up and say, well, this is an authoritative tradition and I've gleaned this from an, an authoritative source and you know, therefore I am in keeping with this great tradition. And what you're really doing when you say that is you're simply borrowing on the authority of tradition. You're not simply saying, well, this is me and this is what I think and these are my ideas, which I think is a far more honest way of going about it, let's say. Yeah, absolutely. It's something that I'm always very acutely aware of and um, something that I, I, I'm i almost anxious about whenever I put out my work. I remember when I was bringing my book out, um, I had that fear in my head, like, who am I? Why, why should I be allowed to write such a thing? And I remember talking to um, my editor about it once and I said, I don't feel like I really have any right to speak on this as an authority. Um, because all I am is a Welsh person who grew up with the myths as part of my life, and now they still influence part of my life, and that's how I want to present it. Um, but she kind of turned to me and said, well, you you do have an authority because you did grow up within them, and a lot of people can't say that. A lot of people kind of just dip their toes in it when they were much, much older. And I think it's important, and it's something that I try to push in a lot of my work, is this, like you were saying, this idea of being inspired by the traditions and cultures of the past while staying rooted in the knowledge that we are modern people, we will not ever live life exactly like our ancestors did. We will not ever be able to recreate the beliefs that they had because we're not them. We we are not those people. We are modern people. And also being able to put your hand on your heart and say, yeah, this is my belief and not something that maybe originates in the lore or the myth, that's fine but to not present it as if it is part of the huge kind of lore and continuum that we have. It's kind of staying, it's like you said at the beginning, um, I like when you, when you said that you look at the myths and these, these legends and these stories that are important to us at, from the perspective of what did they mean to the people of the past, but also what do they mean to us now? It's having that kind of one foot in the past, one foot in the present, and knowing that balance, that middle ground, that in-betweenness. And speaking of in-betweenness, I think that's a good segue into Anoven, the concept of the other world. So this episode is specifically targeted towards um, Anoven or the other world and otherworldly forces that kind of play a role in Welsh mythology. I think it's safe to say that otherworldly kind of forces, I suppose, play a, quite a significant role in especially the Mabinogi, um, they're kind of, they're either there in a subtle way or they're there in a very overt way, such as in the first branch where Aran is literally very overtly there and he takes Poich into the other world. Whereas we have the more kind of subtle ones like, um, say, the second branch where we have references to things that might be otherworldly, but it's not a huge overtly kind of like, we are in the other world. It's more subtle. And um, I think because of that, I think it's an important topic to explore and I think it was also, I, I don't know if maybe I'm kind of putting my foot in it by saying this, but I do believe that when it comes to, to go back to what I was saying about, are there any kind of complicated things, misrepresentations, things that are maybe problematic? I do think the concept of the other world within Welsh mythology and Celtic mythology in general is something that has been kind of 
thrown about and played with for so long now that there's so many beliefs and views out there that have been muddied and muddled up over time that now it's really hard to find good solid information about well, what is the other world because people are mixing it up with well it's exactly like the greek underworld or it's exactly like the christian hell or it's an afterlife it's the summerlands for pagans and all of those kind of i'm going to i'm going to maybe um get a bit of hate for saying this but i think all of those perspectives like oh it's the greek underworld or it's like the uh, the afterlife of christian theology i think all of those are quite missing the point almost but we'll get into that in a second so i suppose the first way to kind of approach anulven and the other world is maybe if you could give us a quick introduction to what exactly anulven is as though you were explaining it to someone who knows absolutely nothing about Welsh mythology. What is Anulven? Blimey. Okay. So, unfortunately, there is no easy answer, but maybe the the simplest place to begin and expand from is the word itself, Anulven. It appears to mean something like the very deep inside world, is one way of understanding what anoven means etymologically speaking. So an is an affirming prefix. It's a, you know, uh, strengthens the meaning of, of the name, but it also can mean inside. Whereas doven is a very interesting word in Middle Welsh because it not only means deep and profound, as it still does in modern Welsh, but in, in the past, in medieval Wales, it also meant the world. And it could also mean the depths of the sea. So all in all, we can kind of gather that the implied meaning in the etymology, at least, is this sense of a deep, profound space or aspect or dimension that's implied somehow in this world. And that's pretty much how the Welsh bards use the term anoven. But this is where things get a little bit complicated because we have the anoven of the Welsh bards and the Welsh bards didn't make loads of use of this term, but the Welsh bards saw anoven as the source of awen and therefore it was a, a sacred, profound space uh, and it was the source of their divine inspiration, their magical inspiration. It was the source of their power in many ways as, as court bards. And, you know, there's there's many interesting allusions to Anoven. One bard in particular mentions that it's, it's also a place of deep memory. So another aspect. Now, we don't know if this bard is speaking metaphorically, if this is just him riffing on the idea of Awen, or if this is in some sense a traditional meaning. And this is part of the problem that we have, is that there aren't that many sources that give us a consistent meaning to Anoven, apart from it's a deep place, and that's where Awen comes from. Beyond that, we kind of venture into Welsh folklore, so it's worth pointing out that the Welsh bards were, you know, a hierarchical patriarchy, a guild of men in the medieval period who practiced a very high art, uh, a very sophisticated art of poetry. And they jealously guarded their knowledge. Uh, and, you know, they, they kind of, they had their own specialist terms and their own specialist understand understanding, like a secret guild, if you like. And then you would have had a slightly different understanding of Anoven, probably, in my opinion, in the broader um, tradition of common folk, of, of pagans in the, in the traditional sense. Paganos being people outside of the urban centres, the people who lived, you know, beyond the sort of the mainstream urban Christianized uh, uh, places of power. And I think for in that context, Anoven was also sometimes just a place that was underground or a magic otherworld place that was accessible through holes in the ground or caves or lakes. Now you can see that there is a relationship between that folk description of Anoven and the classical bardic description in that they are both deep places. So perhaps the folk description is really just a symbolic description of something else. But it could have been a type of underworld in the distant Iron Age past. There's there's hints of that in some very, very ancient Celtic writing, but nothing too clear. So it's complicated because, you know, I think as as 
modern folks, we would understand it as something which is an experience and a subjective experience and therefore difficult to communicate sometimes. And I, I'm just assuming that people in the past had the same problem, that they would have experiences that they found difficult to explain without referring to symbols and mysticism. And Anoven becomes... You know, is this very specialized term in the Welsh Bardic tradition? Is a part of folk belief in in the broader tradition? But also, I think we have to allow f- for it to be a very flexible term that's used for lots of different things that not everybody would have understood. So there's a lot going on. Yeah, Anoven is a big bucket, and there's lots of meanings in there. But those, I think, that's the the, the briefest summary I can give of where I've got to in more recent years. Anyway, one question that I get asked a lot. And it's a very simple question, but it's one that I think comes up a lot and it would be worth uh, talking just briefly about here is the spelling of Anoven. So I I pronounce it Anoven and I've done that since I was about 16 and I got told by Christopher Hughes <laughs> that it's Anoven, not Anon. And um, I before that, I always pronounced it Anon um, because that's the way it's spelt nowadays. If you pick up many kind of translations of the Mabinogi or if you read a okay. lot of books that have been written on the subject of Welsh mythology, it does spell it A double N W N without the F, whereas I prefer to spell it with the F before the final N. Um, I have my reasons for doing it, but I'm just wondering if, from your perspective, you could give us an insight into why there is a variation of spelling and is there a difference between Anoven and Anon? They both mean the same thing and they both refer to the same concept in historical Welsh culture. Um, Anoven is technically the more formal way and I prefer Anoven with the F because you can see the Doven in there. And and you get a sense of the meaning of the word, therefore. Anoven, doven, it's doven, it's deep, yeah? But anon is more like a colloquial or or what you might call like um, the well-used version. So obviously, you know, there are different accents in, in all nations and different regions have different ways of saying stuff. And some time in the past, the F in one particular community just got forgotten about and it became anon. Uh, and, you know, in the book of Taliesin, you'll find, you know, several different spellings for Anoven. So it's not that any of them are wrong necessarily. It's just that I think by today, where if we're talking about Anoven in a formal sense, I would just prefer to use Anoven myself. Uh, but, it, you know, it's really a matter of taste because there's still plenty of people you know, older folk in particular who will still say Anon, you know, my grandparents would have said Anon as opposed to Anoven. So yeah, folk spelling as opposed to formal spelling, I suppose is the simplest way of putting it. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, like yourself, I think the reason I like Anoven is because it has that connotation of Doven. It, it literally gives you the meaning there. But I remember I was speaking to someone once and um, they were very upset that I say Anoven instead of Anon. And when I really dug deep into it, I was like, why? Why does it upset you so much that I say Anoven instead of Anon? And they said, oh, because when you say Kun Anon, it rhymes. <laughs> when you say Kun Anoven, it <laughs> So I suppose it's just personal preference. But yes, I, I like it because of that Doven concept. I I suppose. Uh, And that's the same for a lot of kind of Welsh things, isn't it? There's a lot of, I've noticed lately while kind of putting myself out there, um, I have preferred ways of spelling certain words or saying certain words. And it's not to say that one's incorrect or correct. It's just that um, I suppose it's depending on who's talking and where they've learned their information from. Uh, you could say the same thing about, so for example, Keritwen, I always prefer to spell it with the double R because it evokes that R, the rolling of the R. And same with Aranrod, I prefer Aranrod. I don't know why, I just prefer Aranrod. So there's a few names and words that kind of have various spellings. Um, so if someone, in your opinion, were to try and approach an oven and wish to lo- learn more about it, What are the sources that you would recommend they go to first? Are there any specific legends, myths, poems, anything of that nature that you think really capture the essence of what Anoven is? God, you've got the questions, haven't you? Yes. I mean, I always stress going to the original sources and I I accept that that's difficult because they're written in a way sometimes which is difficult for modern readers to understand. 
uh, and where where we find it difficult to engage with these types of sources because you know we experience literature as like novels where it's all naturalistic and you know stuff happens according to the laws of you know universal reality or whatever and but when we come to stories like <clears throat> the four branches or the book of Taliesin, we're in a symbolic realm. These are symbolic concepts. They're meant to be mysterious. They're meant to evoke a mysticism of, to, of, a, of, a, of a sort. So that said, I would go to the first part of the first branch of the Mabinogi. Poet's period in Anoven is the best illustration we have of the, the type of attitude the storytellers of Wales at least, and I would say the bards also had to Anoven. That is, what is the correct attitude? What are the um, the behaviours that are, are expected of folk who, you know, especially noble people who want to go into Anoven and what does it mean? In that sense, so behaviour, attitude, uh, how the supernatural powers are treated when you're there, and then I would say that the other place that you'll find an an exploration of a sense of Anoven more than an actual breakdown of of what it is and what you should do when you get there is the, uh, the book of Taliesin and certain passages in the book of Taliesin um, sort of echo ideas that we also find in the four branches. These ideas of of a specific attitude to time, but also a particular attitude to what we might call the magic of of performance. And um, and again, you know, this is a it's a difficult thing to to point to actual sources because I'd, I'd have to get them all out and show them to you to to help you think through the logic of what I'm saying. Because no one's, I mean, I've just written all this stuff down in a book, but it, it, you know, it still hasn't come out. So I can't point you to my book and say, look, there it is. But you're going to have to take my word for it. Fundamentally, the, the thing that's usually missing, I find, in our understanding of Anoven today is the alteration of time. Uh, and of course, in the Welsh folk tradition, there's plenty of Welsh folk tales that you can turn to where, you know, people go off and they dance with the Tilworth Teg, the fair folk who are the people of Anoven, and that when you're engaging with the Tilworth Teg, you're in a different temporal dimension, yeah? Time operates differently for you. And I think that the Welsh bards explored this idea of difference in time, and you find this exploration suggested in poems from the Book of Taliesin, of what happens to people when they're being entertained, that there is a power and a magic in performance which evokes a depth in a place and then also takes people out of their normal sense of time. And I think that in, in a very simplistic way, I would say that the bards felt like they had their foot on the threshold of Anoven in performance, therefore. And we've got this very interesting concept in in Welsh, divari, to entertain, which literally means to make unbrief. So to entertain in Welsh basically means to expand or to dilate the moments of our experience so that we're, we're enthralled by every breath and motion and colour and sound and we're fully engaged in the moment of entertainment, whatever that entertainment is. And that that is having sort of your foot on the threshold of Anoven. So that's like an inkling towards, you know, what Anoven could be in a fuller or deeper sense. And, you know, there isn't a, 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 an instruction manual for that. That's just me interpreting sources that I find in the Welsh tradition. But keep come, I keep coming across the same idea time and time again. So I would say there's... You know, being a, a you know trying to be a, a, a safe academic here, there's good reason to believe that that's a, a, a safe interpretation at least to begin with. Yeah, sorry, I couldn't give you an instruction manual. Maybe <laughs> one day. Yeah, people do seem to want an instruction manual. Maybe you should write one. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing that I'm I, I really want to pick up on there is the importance of performance to Welsh culture and the bardic tradition in general. Is this idea that you know 
when we read the myths, I think there's this detachment nowadays, because when we look at the myths, they're written in a book, and we read them as if they're stories. And they are stories, but I mean, it's it's almost undoubtable, isn't it, that these stories were meant to be performed, not just kind of read and studied in silence. They were meant to be something that were communal, that were an experience. And that's a huge part of our culture. And it's something that I do talk about a little because um, my my background is in performance art. So I, I did performing arts at college and university uh, before kind of moving on to do this as my as my career path. So performance has always been a huge um, intrinsic element of my life. And I can see that within the Welsh tradition. I can see how important that is. Um, I, I, I would say I never really understood the story of um, Blodeweth, the creation of Blodeweth. I never understood that story until I saw it performed in front of me um, as a theatre production. I never understood really the story of Branwen before I saw it as a pantomime first, and then I performed it myself as a play later on. And performance is, is really, really important in kind of the understanding. And I've never really made that connection. I, I want to thank you for that, because that connection of the changing of time with, between the other world and performance, I think that's a really cool and interesting connection there. But I suppose where I'm going with this is when it comes to the performance aspect of the the myths that we have, I think um, what a lot of people miss when they read the stories and they only look at it through kind of a literary sense, and it is great literature, but I think mm. there's kind of something missing if we don't look at it as a performance art as well, is that when we look at specifically the four branches of the Mabinaki now, and we think of Anoven, or specifically the denizens of Anoven, those who live and come from Anoven, it's not as clear. In in folklore, it's very clear, like, they are told with Teg, they are Bendith Amamai, they, they are fairies, you know, this is how it's presented in folklore a lot of the time. But in the Mabinoki, it's not. Like, we have characters that nowadays, a lot of pagans and a lot of academics and a lot of people in general associate with the other world and say come from the other world like Rhiannon for example. Rhiannon is one that a lot of people always refer to as an otherworldly character but if you read the Mabinogi it never says Rhiannon comes from Anoven or anything like that and it's in the kind of literary motifs that we're looking at that we kind of get a glimpse of that she possibly is otherworldly. She has a magical nature. She's dressed a certain way. She appears a certain way, riding a specifically coloured horse, similar to Araun in the first branch, who appears dressed in a specific colour, and he's riding a specifically coloured horse, and he has dogs which are a specific colour. And it's almost like this, this symbolism that's within those stories they represent this otherness, this otherworldly nature of these characters. And uh, one thing that I read recently that really um, intrigued me was this idea that contemporary audiences who would have been listening to bards maybe perform these stories, they would have already had an awareness of the other world and Anoven because it was part of their cultural context at that point. And they didn't need the bards to tell them we're talking about Anoven, we're talking about people from Anoven right now. Something as simple as white dogs with red ears or um, a woman dressed in gold brocaded silks that was enough to kind of trigger them and go oh I know that this is an otherworldly character I know that this is someone who possibly is not of this world and has magical qualities to them and we see similar motifs in I think one of my favorite branches of the Mabinogi the third branch with characters like Huedap Kilkoid is it um Huidap Kilcoid is never mentioned as being otherworldly specifically, and yet so many motifs surround him that almost direct you to believe that he must have some connection. His The fact that he can manipulate mist, the fact that he has this castle that just appears out of nowhere and then vanishes and isn't there anymore, um, the fact that he is associated with a boar that is completely white and things like this, similar to Araun in the first branch. So do you think that um, Anoven is more of a kind of symbolic thing in the old myths and especially like the four branches of the Mabinogi do you think that sometimes people are looking for that direct reference going this is Anoven but we don't always get that yeah um, I think again you know you're totally right it comes down to the you know we can identify patterns and motifs in the stories that give us 
the information that we're looking for, but it's a very different way of reading or experiencing a story. And I think, you know, again, we're not so used to engaging with symbolic narrative. We're not so used to work. Well, we kind of are used to working with symbols because we do it all the time, but we're not consciously seeking to interpret symbols and to, to think creatively and engage creatively with stories in that way. And especially when we're dealing with stories that were put together to to require you to engage with them in that way. They're, they're constructed in a way that makes you interpret them if you really want to understand them. There's no other way of doing it, yeah? And, and they're not only in trying to get us to engage with symbolic concepts that describe a particular relationship with the other world, but they're, I would say they're also trying to expand our understanding of what the sacred is and what the other world is, because there's... You know, with, there's often very black and white thinking of, well, I am immortal and that's an immortal, or I am in David and that's Anun. But it doesn't really work like that in the stories. Like Rhiannon, as you put so well, she, you know, she turns up and there are these magical clues to her divine nature, but she ends up being a beast of burden and being treated really badly like a, a, a noble woman in the medieval period. So we've got this journey from beautiful shining horse goddess to mortal noble woman suffering, you know, the, the the worst aspects of patriarchy. And what does that journey tell us about, for example, the sacred as it comes into contact with the mortal realm? What does it tell us about the nature of deity? You know, is it just a separate perfect realm or does it engage with mortality in a different way? You know, what is the relationship between us and the other place? So, these are complex ideas, and there isn't a simple black and white definition that we can lean on. And that's as it's meant to be, because it's meant to draw us into further engagement. It's meant to get us to consider and ponder and meditate and feel out what we mean by these things. And that's the that's the sometimes the the greatest obstacle, I think, is that, like you said, we come at them as stories. It's kind of easier to to grasp the magic of something in performance, but fundamentally, even beyond that, again, there are there are very profound spiritual philosophies embedded in these texts that should take a lifetime to understand. Yeah, it shouldn't all be easily available to you as like a tick list of do this, 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 and this, and then da da. There you go. You know, the, it should require work. I'm afraid and effort and study and meditation and consideration of a of an intense you know an intense source we we should be inspired to engage with them so i'm not surprised that some people come away from reading the stories and think god i just didn't get it you know but that's that's why we need to discuss them debate them look at them in different ways engage with them in different ways and try and feel out the contours of the depths we need to take a step into the depths if we're going to really see the richness of the of of that tradition. So I I've never really put myself forward as being any sort of expert on anything, but my personal passion and interest has always been folklore and folk magic, delving into kind of witchcraft and those kind of areas, magical practice and belief. And because of all those kind of beliefs that I have, I have to look at myth and legend as well. And I do love it, but there is a time where sometimes I go, I don't get it. I don't get all this. And I quite enjoy that nowadays. I enjoy not getting it. There was a period in my life where I completely avoided the story of Kiluch and Olwen because, oh my gosh, <laughs> so much going on there. Um, and now I, I really enjoy diving into these stories, reading them aloud to myself so that I can hear the words and I can kind of get a point of it, which... I wouldn't recommend doing with Killer Knollwin. There's a lot of names in that one, but it is a fun thing to do. And I suppose for me, I love seeing things that connect my two interests. So for me, folklore is kind of the area that I prefer. Not to say that I don't like Welsh mythology or that I prefer it intensely over it, but I think I just have more of a connection to folklore and that area because of my personal interests. I love seeing things that kind of seem similar between Welsh mythology 
and and folklore. So by mythology, I mean specifically the four branches of the Mabinaki, the the romances as we call them nowadays, uh, the Arthurian kind of stories that exist within the Charlotte Guest version of the Mabinogion, I suppose. And um, I really love finding those parallels between the two things. So for example, I have been a little bit obsessed since I was a child with the idea of the islands that appear somewhere in the sea um, in folklore. There's so many stories about people sailing out to the sea, coming across an island that wasn't there before, stepping on it, and then, oh, time has gone somewhere. And suddenly, when they make it back to shore, they perish into dust because time has gone so far forward that it's all caught up with them all at once. And there's a lot of these stories of these islands in the sea that are inherently magical or otherworldly, I suppose, within Welsh folklore. Um, many kind of stories call them Gwerddon Eichion or the Green Meadows of Enchantment. And there's stories of these islands appearing and fairies or people from these islands, the Tulwith Teg, coming off of them to shop at human markets or mortal marketplaces. And what I really got a bit obsessed with a few um, years back was in the second branch of the Mabinogi, we also have the island of Gwales. And Gwales is almost similar in nature to these folkloric islands that exist. You know, for those who haven't read the second branch of the Mabinogi or aren't as familiar with it, after Bran or Bendigedran dies, um, they first go to Hadlech and feast for several years, it's seven years, uh, uh, with the birds of Rhiannon singing over them. And then uh, Bran's head is taken to uh, the Enesqualas, the island of Gwales, where uh, they can feast and they can be joyful and be together without grief so long as there's these three doors in this fort on this island and so long as the third door remains closed they can stay there and be devoid of grief and all this and time seems to move differently they don't age they don't there's nothing of that sort until someone gets a bit um, curious and opens the door eventually and everything kind of rushes in all at once all that grief all that pain all that trauma of what happened over in Ireland when Bran died and then they have to take him to be buried and uh, is it London Tower of London <laughs> Um, so that story to me I remember when I first kind of started delving into it on a deeper level the instant kind of thing I started thinking of was oh it's kind of similar to those islands in folklore where time moves differently and they seem to be otherworldly in nature I know that Gwales is a, is a real island isn't it down in uh, the coast of Pembroke but as far as I'm aware there's no fort on it and that's part of the mythology of it and that makes it quite otherworldly in my eyes. So I I suppose that segues us into this discussion of the Anoven of kind of mythology and the Bardic tradition. Are they very very vastly different to the Anoven and the other world and this fairy kind of realm <clears throat> that we're introduced to in folklore and folk belief? I don't know Mara. <laughs> um... But I will say that there's definitely a sense of whatever the mythology is in the four branches, as we have them as a written text, it's like a snapshot of, of a broad and evolving tradition. And it's just one tiny window onto this broader network of mythological and symbolic meaning that then evolves over the centuries and turns up in sort of in the folk traditions of 100, 200, 300 years ago. So this evolving body of mythology, its basic concepts, they remain relatively consistent and stable for long periods of time, which suggests to me that storytellers and, you know, of all sort of classes in society – from the, the lowest land worker to the, the highest nobleman, all these storytellers, they shared a common understanding of what these myths could mean. So we've got this amazing conservatism in the tradition. And to try and answer your question, and, and basically, you know, I can only go on my own instincts at this level because we don't have enough data. We don't have enough information to make an objective assessment of whether there is uh, you know, a, a, a correlation between the classical bardic uh, notion of Anoven and the, the folk notion of Anoven and the idea of these islands in particular. What is common to both of these examples of Anoven, if you like, is 
the the Welsh t- bardic tradition did have a very uh, close connection to water as a symbol, so symbolic water. Water appears to be sometimes it's a metaphor for awen. Sometimes it's a like an elemental force in the world that's see through yet has force and does stuff. And water also has you know uh, waters in rivers or in seas. Crossing the sea is often uh, a you know a metaphor for crossing into the other world, crossing into different spaces. The whole sort of symbolic quality of water as its connection to birth, that it, you know, it's the first, it comes before the, the baby turns up. All of this stuff, the fact that it comes out of the ground and it nourishes and keeps the land alive and it is sacred in the full sense. In that sense, I'm a bit of a water devotee, but so, so water in the full sense, uh, is something that's definitely appreciated in all parts of the tradition, I would say. But whether or not the bards, a thousand years ago would have agreed with the the folk living on, you know, in Keredigion, looking out to sea, you know, dreaming of these blessed isles out in the West. Whether there is a correspondence between those cultures specifically, I kind of doubt it. But if we got those people together in a room and they started conversing, within, you know, a few drinks, I reckon they'd probably start agreeing on some stuff. But I'd I'd also like to preserve this idea of of a great diversity in the Welsh tradition, as well as a degree of conservatism too. There is consistency, but there's also variation, and I think that's in, that's important. Absolutely, and I think um, one thing that I have to touch upon while we're here, we're talking about this topic of like the the ways that Anovan has has this variation in the way that it's um represented is specifically if we're talking about the denizens or the people that come from the other world supposedly in the mabinoki and such of course we've got we introduce ourselves to um characters like Aran, who is represented as this king of anovan um or the king of anovan and then uh Havgad is kind of I don't know if there's I, I don't know if I'm reading too much into this but I noticed when I read the Shauna Davis translation of the first branch, Aran is introduced as a king of Anovan or the king of Anovan, whereas Havgan is kind of introduced as a king in Anovan uh, as instead. I don't know if that's me reading too much into the wordplay there, but we have these entities and these characters that if you go and read any kind of collection of folklore afterwards and they talk about the other world or the, the fairy realm or whatever you want to call it, um, they hi- kind of disagree about who rules Anovan. There's this whole like discrepancy. We've got then Gwynapnir being thrown into the mix. Um, Gwynapnir, of course, is very popular nowadays among pagans. Uh, he's become this kind of king of fairy, and I I quite love him because he's he's very diverse in the way that he's represented, and I think that is very. Um, very fairy, I suppose, if we're going to use that term, fairy. It's very fairy, this idea that fairies in Celtic mythology in general, or folklore in general, have this very contradictory nature. It's almost like nobody can really agree what they are, or who they are, or what exactly, where they come from, or anything like that. When you look at the Welsh tradition, you have some folklorists who claim that they are the spirits of dead druids, that they are literally the spirits of the dead being turned into Anovians because Anovan is equated with an afterlife because of that kind of I assume because of the Christian cosmology moving into it then and then you also have theories that um, they are just denizens they are people who come from the other world Uh, but who exactly fairies are is very contradictory there's a lot of kind of are they spirits are they corporeal are they physical in nature what are they who knows there's something in between all of those things kind of thing and Gwyn Apnid kind of is like that as well because he has these so many different identities within Welsh culture in you know if you read Cilwch and Olwen the Gwyn Apnid in Cilwch and Olwen seems very very different and far from the Gwynapnir in Bichet Cochen and then again when you read more modern interpretations of who Gwynapnir is to the people who live in Glastonbury nowadays who see him as this horned god of the forest this green man 
again, very, very different to the mythological or the Bichet Kochen interpretation. So there's all these different facets of Gwynap Niv. Uh, and like you said in the beginning when we talked about is there anything problematic that comes from the way that pagans approach these things, it's the way that the waters have been muddied now with people who kind of dip their toes in and pour what they want without looking at the whole picture. Instead, like they see one little thing. And I think the the element from Kiluch and Olwen that they pull from Gwyn is the fact that he said to have all the demons of Anoven within him, that God has placed all the demons of Anoven, and that is proof that he is king of Anoven. And then they mix that with the folkloric sources that we have. And I'm kind of tangenting now, but <laughs> essentially what I'm saying is that there is this um, almost diversity in the way Anoven is approached within the folkloric tradition, or the other world is approached within the folkloric tradition, because we also have this disagreement about who rules it? Who who actually governs it? Is it Araun? Is it Gwyn? I've come across stories where Araun is said to be the ruler, and then we get into really murky areas like the concept of the wild hunt, which is, again, very popular nowadays among pagans, where um, if you read, say, Marie Trevelyan or um, Wurt Sykes, they don't mention Gwynapnir at all in relation to the wild hunt, if wild hunts actually exist within Welsh folklore. Um, they refer to the wild hunt as being led by Araun or King Arthur, or there's a, another entity called Machdanos. Um, Coilion Cymru, the book, kind of references this horned figure who leads the wild hunt. But in pagan circles, no, it's Gwynapnir. Gwynapnir leads the wild hunt, and it's a huge aspect of Welsh culture, supposedly. So I suppose I just wanted to ask, like, what do you think is at play there? Do you think, I know it's a very big question, but why is it that there is just so much that is diverse in that area? And specifically, when we look at the rulers of Anoven, if there is a hierarchy of who rules over it why do we have all these different names and figures for a king of Anoven? because I, I feel like you have a very good insight into that well Mara uh it's a very simple but unsatisfactory answer and it's just humans you know to go a bit deeper into it I think it's easy to forget that the four branches were composed by one unique author Bichet Kochen was written down by one unique author. Folklorists, people who collected folklore, themselves filtered the traditions that they saw. So all we ever have are the restricted and filtered um, perspectives of individuals on mysteries. And then what we like to do as cultures and groups of people and something which I try and not do is we we always move towards dogma and we always move towards oh it's definitely like this and there's definitely a lot more you know and we get into these weird I suppose it's it's you know we're always doing we identify ourselves with the things we believe in and then when those things are uh, not as they should be in the world, then we feel threatened in our identities. I, I understand. I totally get it. I get it. But specifically on this idea of the kings of Anoven, there are some very interesting connections, for example, between Gwynapnid and between Aram. The storytellers used these folk characters for similar purposes. So the storyteller who gives us the full branch of the Mabinogi is using traditional materials, but it's still their telling of a tale. Same with with uh, whoever it was that gives us Bichet Kochlen, the story of Gwynapnid and St. Kochlen in Glastonbury, what have you, that these are versions of folk belief that are turned into stories. That's the first thing to bear in mind. But there appears to be something in folk belief where Araun and Gwynapnid do something relatively similar, in that they are both kings of Anoven. They both present temptations to mortals, and they both test mortals. Now, we could, in a modern sense, collapse sacrilege, I know, but collapse Gwynapnid and Daraun into one archetype and somehow dispel the magic of these, uh, these mythological figures because we're explaining them away, in a sense. But there is something archetypal about both these characters, and they do perform similar things. They do do, they're both magical huntsmen. They're both representative of a particular type of initiatory male figure who, who is initiating men in a particular way 
and specifically men, young men in relation to temptation. And it always has something to do with hunting, hunting being the great pursuit of, of the nobility in the past. So even though I don't want to collapse the mystery into a simple rationalized archetype, it is also a way of understanding the deeper mythology that's going on. Because temptation, offence, offending the supernatural powers, thereby instigating a temptation, thereby instigating a testing and an initiation, appears to be common to the magical huntsman as an archetype. So we do need to understand that and we do need to appreciate that there is like an internal logic to that deeper mythology, while also allowing for the fact that Gwynapnith, a Brennan Lloyd, Aaron, Hearn the Hunter, whoever, these are all regional and localized expressions of an engagement with supernature, which was real and sacred to the people who experienced them in the past. So I don't want to, you know, I want to do both again. I suppose I want to be, I want to be liminal again. I want to have one foot in, you know, let's understand them in the archetypal sense, but let's also respect them as unique historical traditions of, of the past too. Does that help? Absolutely, yes. It's something that I, I think I'm really exploring lately uh, on a personal level and exploring with my patrons and um, people that will listen, anyone who will listen to me rant really, <laughs> is this concept of, um, I think, I, I don't know if this will just be me ranting for a second, but um, I think people are very obsessed with turning the myths of any culture really into this almost harry potter-esque kind of old lord of the rings-esque kind of thing where there is the law and there is a correct way to look at it there's a correct story and that's just not the way these stories work because they have been influenced by so many different people over so many centuries and they are going to be nuanced they're going to be strange they're going to have contradictions and i think we could do with accepting that a bit better within kind of mythological circles, the people who like mythology and folklore. Yeah, we could yeah. do with accepting that, yes. Yeah, I totally agree. And and there's nothing worse for me than trying to teach someone who has an incredibly fixed opinion of what it is that we're talking about because they can't learn anything new. They're kind of the there's no sense of progressing into new experiences and new engagements with these things and new, you know, fresh, living, vibrant ways of being in the world and engaging with supernature and the sacred and however you want to describe it, you know. So I feel like it's a shame because it, it's a limitation and it's a, it's a boxing off and a restriction of something which is actually very alive and very vibrant, which is one of the great positive things about the pagan scene in many ways, because it is, it's, you know, it's living. Yeah. It's a living thing. It's tangible. You can touch them. They're real, you know. Absolutely. Yes. I think one thing that me and my coven, I have a little coven that, uh, and we discuss things like this. And one thing that we've been talking about lately is this idea that inspiration kind of needs creativity and innovation to go hand in hand with it. Inspiration without kind of innovation and creation is stagnation. It ends up leading to nothing. And I, I love that. I love the idea that we not only need to look at these myths as they have been presented, as they have been interpreted, but also look at it from our perspective as well. And to get a little bit geeky about it, accepting the idea that, to use a Doctor Who quote, that these stories are going to be very wibbly wobbly timey wimey. They're not going to make sense all the time. And they're not, you're not going to find a true solid, like piece of lore that is like accepted by absolutely everyone because you'll find a contradiction somewhere whether it's in the 13th century or whether it's in the 19th century you'll find someone who argues against that idea and i think we could do as i said with accepting that more and i suppose that kind of leads us to an ending ish now because we've been talking for a while i've had an absolute blast talking to you and i think i could talk to you for absolutely hours oh, <laughs> And I might be rude and cheeky and ask you to come on again in future <laughs> to talk about other topics if we could have you. Uh, but before we kind of go, I just wanted to say you you offer so much to people in regards to Celtic myths and Celtic legends and understanding these concepts. And you provide so much, not only like 
do you provide it? But it's it's also there free. You're very accessible with it. So there's you've got so much free stuff, but you also do the courses and all this. Uh, and if anybody wants to look you up, I very much recommend looking up Celtic Source online. But could you give us a little bit of an outro just... Um, where can people find you? What have you got planned? Anything you want to kind of promote right now? So my courses are all on CelticSource.online um, and a lot of them are video courses. Uh, so a lot of the material is recorded by now, although I still like to keep my hand in doing live. I love live courses. I love talking to people. I love the discussion and the inspiration and the the energy that that people get from talking to each other. So there's there's that at CelticSource.online. There's a bunch of free courses and and videos there as well. Even though you know, I still think a lot of that free stuff is really just scratching the surface. There's so much. I think there's something like 120 hours worth of videos somewhere on my website and just loads of stuff but anyway and then um i suppose the other thing i'd like people to know is that i have actually finished writing a book um it's just much bigger and longer than i expected it to be and it took far longer um but that that's very close i mean the the first draft is done so it's just it's getting proofread now and hopefully if a publisher will have it it's there I'm thinking about self-publishing it because I don't think I can be asked going through a publisher, but I don't know. But there's a book coming soon. So maybe when the book comes, I'll come back and talk to you, Mara. Absolutely. And I'm very excited for that. <laughs> Definitely. So if anybody wants to check you out, head over to Celtic Source because I guarantee that anything that uh, Gwilin puts out is absolutely fabulous as always. Thank you so much for being here with me today and for talking with us and dispensing your wisdom and hopefully we'll see you very soon again here. And a devotal, diolch for iawn. Diolch. Well, a huge thank you to Gwilym Morris Baird for coming on to the Welsh Rich podcast and delighting us with his knowledge of the Welsh Otherworld. And I'm hoping that we'll be able to entice Gwilym to come back very, very soon, especially if he has a book coming out. And thank you so much for tuning in to this latest episode of the Welsh Witch Podcast. Now, if you'd like to support the podcast, you can join my Patreon for as little as £1 a month, and it helps me to produce episodes like this and keep doing what I'm doing. My patrons also get early exclusive access to the podcast episodes before anyone else gets to hear them. This episode was actually uploaded about 20 days before anyone else heard it. And not only do they get to hear them early, but they also get access to the full unedited video interviews. So you get to sit and chill with us as we talk, as me and my guest talk, and you get it unedited. This original episode was, I think, an hour and 20 minutes long, and I had to condense it and cut it down for timing reasons. So if you'd like to hear the full unedited chat where we talk about a few other things, including things such as the origin of the Bichedd Cochen story, as well as the concept of Avalon, Anis Avachon, and its connections to the other world, then head over to my Patreon, where you can sign up and listen to that, as well as get access to all sorts of other exclusive content. Do check Gwilym out. The links will be in the show notes down below. But of course, you can also check out his work at CelticSource.online. Thank you so much for watching, or listening, I suppose. Diolch amoranto, and I will see you next time. Goodbye. Thank you.